and it was weird because I didn't know, you know, when I read it, I won this thing and then it, it came the hurricane and, and all of a sudden I couldn't write. <laughs> and then came the terremotos and then came the pandemic. But before mm -hmm. that, uh, we went to, we spent a month in Bellagio, which is a really, really tiny town that I, that gave me the peace, but it was a weird place to write it. And when I read it, when I read the 100 pages that I submitted, I said, oh my God, this is crap. And I had to start all over again. It was complete crap. And I threw away all that and I rewrote it. And then I finished it here during the pandemic, actually. And now it's finished. So I said, <laughs> <you laughs> <for laughs> <me." laughs> Well, I'm loving, I'm loving it. All um, those stories behind the story, you know. And besides, I've decided that after the hurricane, I don't want to write traditional fiction anymore. So, um, you know, I said, where do I start? And I said, well, with, with who started it all? Julia. You Julia. Know, Julia oh, I love it. Oh. <laughs> and I think on that have so note much fun chatting <laughs> so much to say i think on that note um it would be great to start this event so um first of all welcome all to celebrating julia de burgos past and present in conversation my name is ivan mangal and i am a sophomore in polymary at yale college um, this event is part of the Espeta boricua at yale's 50th anniversary and was organized in collaboration with La Casa Cultural de Julia de Burgos. As we begin, I would like to take the time to recognize the lands we reside on through Yale's official statement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skatikok, Golden Hill Pogasset, Nehantic, and the Kinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and the nations and this land. It is now my pleasure to first introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Lee Jun Alvarado. Dr. Alvarado is a Yale and Desperta Boricua alumni, JEO2, and holds a PhD in English from Fordham University. She is the author of the poetry collection, Words or Water. Her work has appeared in scholarly and literary journals, including Melus, Centro Journal, The Accentos Review, Vida Review, and the anthology, Wise Latinas, Writers on Higher Education, among others. Her article, Ambivalence and the Empire City, Julia de Burgos's New York, examines the ways in which de Burgos's writings from and about New York reveal an ambivalence towards the metropolis that is rooted in imperial history and in her position as artist, activist, woman, and migrant. Li Jun is a native New Yorker living in California who, pre-pandemic, took frequent trips to Salinas, Puerto Rico to visit La Familia. It is also with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Mayra Santos Febres. Mayra Santos Febres was born in Carolina, Puerto Rico in 1966. She studied literature at the University of Puerto Rico and earned a PhD at Cornell University. She has been a visiting scholar at Rutgers, Cornell and Harvard University, as well as Complutense University in Spain, Autonomous University in Mexico at Yucatan campus and Leipzig University in Holland. She co-created the creative writing program for the University of Puerto Rico and founded and directed the Word Festival de la Palabra, the most internationally recognized literary festival in Puerto Rico. Content creator for the Interdisciplinary and Multicultural Institute at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayra Santos Febres is currently the principal investigator for the development of the University of Puerto Rico's Afro-Diasporic and Race Studies Program, which has recently been awarded a Mellon Foundation grant for academic diversification. As a writer, 
Mayra Santos Febres has won many international prizes and recognitions, such as the Letras de Oro Award, Radio France Juan Rulfo Award, the Premio Primavera Award for her novel Nuestra Señora de la Noche, and the John S. Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as the Rockefeller Bellagio Center Residency. Her literary work has been translated into French, English, Italian, Romanian, Korean, Portuguese, and Icelandic. <laughs> she has published numerous poetry collections, short stories, and novels, including Anamu y Managua, Manigua, Huracanada, Mujeres Violentas, and La Amante de Gardel. In, in 2019, she won the Prix National de Littérature de l'Académie de Pharmacie in Paris, France, for her novel, La Amante de Gardel. It is a true honor to learn from two such distinguished Puerto Rican writers. Please join me and join me in welcoming our two guests. I will now pass it on to Dr. Santos Febres. Buenas, saludos a todos y a todas y a todes. Eh, gracias por este regalo, verdad? Eh, el día del natalicio de Julia de Burgos. Um, I'm a big fan of Julia de Burgos. I know that she is a very uh, interesting uh, and contradictory figure, but I think that her life and uh, and her life is a testimony of the history of Puerto Rico. You know, she was born from an alcoholic father, <laughs> as many of us, uh, and uh, in the hinterlands of Carolina, Puerto Rico, and she was a, she was um, her mother, Paula, had 12 kids, six survived. And, um, and then she was born in the rural town and rural sector of, of San Anton in Barrazas. And then she migrated to the center of the town in Carolina. And she stayed there with a student, with a teacher that, that decided that she was so intelligent that she had to stay in town in order to go to a middle school. And then from there, she uh, migrated again to go to UHS, University High School, at the University of Puerto Rico in very, very difficult conditions. And from Puerto Rico, she migrated to New York and then to Washington and then to Cuba and then uh, again to New York where she died at the age of 39 years old. And she was an alcoholic also, you know, but by that time, at last, uh, when she was in, in Bellevue Hospital, somebody at last, you know, told her that alcoholism is not a moral disease, but an actual, you know, a health disease. And uh, she decided to stay there because there were only two women at the hospital that were suffering the same uh, illness as her. And, uh, and she knew that in Puerto Rico, she wasn't going to be able to have at least that support. But at the end, uh, she couldn't make it. And one day she just collapsed in 106th Street in Harlem, New York. And uh, her life for me is wonderful. And maybe um, one of the most important things about Julia de Burgos is definitely that uh, she embodies our history as colonized and also as um, marginalized people in many ways. But also for me, it was really important that it was the first poet that I ever read that voiced in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the Spanish speaking you know, uh, language, a poem called Ay 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 de la Grifa Negra in which she voiced, she was the first one to voice the contradiction of being an afro latina and uh, i saw in the in that poem the the door that i was looking for when i was growing up in carolina eh, puerto rico a little kid that wanted to be a writer um, actually i didn't even know that i wanted to be a writer i just needed to write very very early i don't know how to add uh, and I am not very good with many things, but I do have a thing for words. They touch my soul in a very particular way. 
And uh, I decided that I wanted to dedicate my life to the exploration of expression and words, but I, I didn't see anybody that was doing that and that looked like me or that was able to express the things that were going through what's go, were going through my head. What is this thing of being a woman, a Puerto Rican, and an evidently a, a, a person of African descent, not persona evidentemente negra, no? Because you know that in Puerto Rico we have we're all, most of us are a, what I call Afro Taínos, no? Most of us are a mixture of of all things that came of all the people that came to the island. And, and maybe we can talk about that a little later. But um, our brand of racism, which I call forced integration is racism in the island. You know? Due to the ideology of racial democracy and mestizaje erases um, the voices and the presences of many, many uh, Puerto Ricans and Caribbeans from Afro that are Afro descendants. And so to hear this wonderful woman express the, um, the situation, you know, of being of African descent, ay, 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 de la grifa negra, was the first clue that, that, that was presented, you know, to me in her work in order to explore uh, the possibilities and the literary po and aesthetics and, and ethical possibilities of, of being an Afro-Latina and an Afro-Puerto Rican uh, writer and intellectual, because that's my new, what I want to be when I grow up is a public, an Afro-Puerto Rican and Afro-Latina American and Afro-Latina public intellectual. That's what I want to do when I grow up. Still a long way to go because I'm very mature. But eh, <laughs> I'm working on it. And, um, and one of the things that that, that book specifically eh, held uh, in El Maritu, you know, that poem that was a very early poem. It was of the 1932, 1936, something like that. Then you have to wait until 1944 for Virginia Brindis de Salas in Uruguay to call Tregones to, to published Pregones de Mari Morena. And then you have to wait uh, until the 60s or, or the fifth, the beginning of the 60s for Georgina Herrera in Cuba to write Oriqui para mi misma. Um, she is the oldest and most important uh, Afro-Cuban writer, woman writer, but she has been silenced by the revolutionary government in Cuba. This is really funny because then they, they put Nancy Morejon in the forefront, which is a wonderful friend too, but they silenced Georgina that has a very direct and critic, uh, critical voice, you know, very, very uh, uh, strong voice, then uh, denunciando, you know, um, the racism within the, the Cuban revolutionary movement and Nancy Morejon has been more silent about it um, because she's another writer, you know, she writes about other things. So um, I, I have studied both of them and in the Dominican Republic also in the seventies, you had to wait until Chiqui Bici also and Josefina Baez that, were, that lives and, and writes from New York City uh, uh, wrote about this, this identity and this experience of, of, of being in the Caribbean and in the world. And, uh, and then, you know, Angela Maria Davila came from Macau, Puerto Rico. She was a mentor of mine. And, and um, I'm very grateful that she uh, polished me. Wonderful writer, Angela Maria Davila, she's dead now. And then me, you know, and uh, there's very few other women writers, Afro, Latina, Afro, uh, Latin American women writers that have been writing, but they're coming out now, like in, bu in bunches, and it's wonderful. Dan Mayano, Mariposa Fernandez, este, Lillun, Dani Abreu, all these writers that identify as Afro Latinas and, and people of African descent within Puerto Rico, no, no, no without any. Este, 
sin ninguna negociación, without any negotiation and saying, look, you know, there is an expression and there is a way of being Afro-Latina that is different from the African-American experience, but is also different from um, other experiences uh, of, of racialization within uh, our continents. So it's really important for me to, to explore uh, Julia de Burgos as one of the first who was able to, to put it in words. And I'm very grateful for her, for having her, you know. Another thing that is really interesting, and you tell me when I shut up, um, eh, Ivan, eh, because I just wanted to say this, this is really important. Um, when I study Julia de Burgos, and I study it not in an academic way, I study it as, I don't know how to explain how I study Julia de Burgos since I was 13 years old to now that I'm 55. And I know it doesn't look like it because tú sabes, lo negro no desmerece, you know, but uh, <laughs> I have been studying her all my life. First, I studied her poetry. There's some poetry that is really, you know, pre-romantic, very malcochoso kind of incredibly romantic poetry that I don't like. But then, you know, I started studying something interesting about the way in which she talked about the, the joining and the meeting of souls. And, um, and then I discovered that although she always said that she was a communist and that she didn't believe in God, she also, when she was very young, practiced uh, Espiritismo. She was very, very touched by Espiritismo, which is... Um, one of those religions that are that are native to the Caribbean, and I know that many of you, or if not, just ask, because there is no Puerto Rican or Caribbean family in this day and age that doesn't have a Santiguador, an Espiritista, a Santero eh, in our, you know, family tree. This is, it is there, you know. And most of our families actually felt ashamed of that, uh, uh, the, of the practice of that spiritual tradition because it has been demoni demonized. And that is part of the experience of colonization. You know that colonization worked, you know, through the racialization of native, um, of the natives of the islands and many people and also uh, um, through the discourse that these people, that means us, had no culture and no soul. We had no morality, we had no soul, we had no spirituality. Those things were demonic and it was witchcraft and it was primitive. And um, I, I come from one of those families. My grandmother was a Santiguadora and she also uh, was a curandera, like many, many, many. Now they call it natural health and, you know, aromaterapia and all that. But I grew up, you know, nena, tomate este tecesito para el mal de la barriga. And if you had an infection in your ear, te ponían yerba bruja and it cleared it. You didn't have to take any of those pills. I still can't take them. Um, but I was ashamed of my grandmother and her way of healing as I was ashamed of my mother putting una, un vaso boca arriba con una vela y el San Miguel Arcángel detrás eh, because um, that was the mark of primitivism. I had to learn and unlearn also a lot in order to recognize eh, all that cultural, rich cultural traditions that could give me eh, archetypes for writing my country again. In a, in, a, in a different note than the colonial note. So I started reading Julia de Burgos in that, from that perspective, and, and I figured out, and, and you know, Lee Jung has been reading one of my latest books. This, this hasn't been published yet, so I, I'm working on it. It's a manuscript um, about Julia and the way in which Julia, when she was little, she um, did 
rosarios cantados, San Baquines, when the little brothers or the little kids in, in her neighborhood died, and also how she went to El Centro Espiritista de Rio Piedras, and they were the ones that gave her money in order to be able to uh, pay for enrollment in the UHS high school. And all these incredible, you know, connective institutions that through um, spirituality wove a net of support for Julia and for many others. I don't know if you, if you have studied the importance of, of Masones, of, of people who are great Masons, uh, in the development of Pedro Albizu Campos and in the development of, of, of many other but Betances, Schomburg, Arturo Schomburg, and so many others. The only bad thing is that the Masons are all men. So women could not participate from that web of support. And so uh, this incredible intertwining of all the race situation, but the, but the, but the very difficult you know, positioning that Julia had vis-a-vis a, a men and vis-a-vis -vis the, the women of higher classes that always, always marginalized her and criticized her. And it was funny because those were the ones that also recuperated her body when she died in Harlem. You know what happens in our communities that they lash at us and they trash us and at the same time they save us. The weird love-hate relationship that we have with our families and with our communities. Um, but at the same time, you know, all that love. And Julia was there and she received and also was denied that love. And her intellectual development, she was almost an autodidactic, you know. She had two years at the University of Puerto Rico. Her mother that was dying, she had to run to, to work. And I know that you understand what is that because I, I grew up like that too, you know, I had to work while I was studying because it was never enough. And in many ways, many weird ways, we can talk about that later. Also, that was part of it. But this, what I was trying to say was that this connection with spirituality and nature was really important in Julia. The way in which she saw herself in, in, in every living thing uh, and if you don't understand that, it is very difficult to read El Rio Grande de Loisa, de Rama de Mi Rio Hombre. If you try to see it from an Eurocentric point of view, because what she was talking about was, was it comes from another place, you know? And is this connection we uh, people from the islands and, and we Caribbean people have with nature as a source of spirituality, you know? So basically that is uh, what fascinates me of Julia de Burgos. And if we want to, I've been talking for 20 minutes <laughs> uh, nonstop, but if you want to direct some questions and start a dialogue, I'll be happy to, to participate. Yay. I have so much to say and ask and I'm like chomping at the bit. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to take a point of personal privilege first, because I know some of you were here when we started, but I just want to say, um, as an alum, I remember coming to campus and Crown Street, where La Casa Cultural Julia de Burgos exists, wasn't on some of the maps. Like the Latino Cultural Center was literally off of Yale's, mm -hmm. the, old, the old campus map right at the beginning of my time there. And, and that changed over time. Uh, before I left, Crown Street had more restaurants and bars. So all of a sudden it was like embraced as part of the old campus and we were made visible where we had been somewhat invisible, um, which I think we see echoes, right? We think about um, Julia de Burgos's visibility. Mm -hmm. and invisibility and who allows her to be visible and who not. And I've shared with some of the students, um, you know, before we all kind of logged in, that um, at the time, La Casa was the only building 
named after a woman of color, certainly, and maybe after a woman at all. So now we have Polly Mary, Polly Murray College, right? So we've moved to a new, a new Yale era. But as as um, as late as 1998, having a building named after Julia de Burgos was a really big deal on this campus named after many slave owners, right? Like this is that tension. And what does that mean um, in a city with so many Boricuas? That was such an important part of the founding of Despierta Boricua, as it has been told to me. I know there's some folks <laughs> who can tell these stories from firsthand experience, but as has been told to me, um, so much of the founding of the Despierta Boricua had to do with the relationship between Yale students and the Puerto Rican community of New Haven. Mm -hmm. So it was not a Yale centric mm -hmm. organization, institution. Um, and so when we think of someone like Julia de Burgos and we think about one thing I, I, during the transition to the unification and there was tension, like, do you keep a Puerto Rican name when you're uniting with the Chicanos and the other Lat Latinx communities on campus? And there was, you know, some tension around that. But once you start getting to know Julia de Burgos better, you realize she came to New York. She started writing in Pueblos Hispanos. She was writing for a much broader uh, yeah. comunidad hispana. She lived in Cuba it was much more rich than this tension, Puerto Rican, Chicano, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that tension did not really exist in terms of once you start diving in. So I thought it was, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful um, that she has this kind of privileged position on, on Yale's campus in this way. So I'm glad the mural remains and that kind of history, uh, exists in a physical structure on the on Yale's campus um, and, and and these conversations help illuminate why it's such an apt name for and, the <laughs> and also Li Jung, another thing that is really important is the relationship between Julia de Burgos and the Dominican Republic and yes. also you know La Oda Trujillo how important that was for her to write and how uh, uh, visible she was in the fight against the uh, Leonidas Trujillo. Trujillo's regime. Exactly. And also how important it was for her to live in Cuba and try with uh, Jimenez Grullón to participate in the draft of the 1940s constitution, Cuban constitution, which was the most uh, important and avant-garde constitution that there was and she, she really really fought in order to to work with Balaguer and with I'm sorry with um what was this guy the friend of 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 Jimenez Juan Bosch Juan Juan Bosch y con Balaguer yeah. y con Juan Bosch y con, y con Jimenez Grullón and with many others yeah. she also was a uh, the protege and she started uh, writing to sustaining correspondence with Gabriela Mistral and with Paolo. Yes. I mean, this woman was an internationalist. National. She believed that all Latin Americans and all immigrants should, should, you know, should unite. She came from that vision that yeah. Latin America is one. And she called Latin America, eh, La America eh, Amerindia. She was always talking about the importance of uh, the recognition of the, the first los, los pobladores nativos de toda nuestra América. So it was an incredible woman. She was really, really intelligent. She was also one, the first woman to win two times el Premio eh, Nacional de Literatura. She was the first and she won it twice. Right. She won it once with poetry and another one with essay. And she was a periodista. Thank so uh, she was a journalist. So this is an intellectual. This is a public intellectual. That's she was and, of... and prolific. I mean, when I started um, working on the chapter with the Woodwalls, trying to read, I, I was like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's going to take me a while. There's a lot here. She was prolific, much like you. <laughs> um, 
I would love to ask you. I did. I I want to ask you because you brought it up. Like, well, I'll jump ahead. I want to talk about the the anti blackness piece because it was so um, it was so complicated um, mm -hmm. in 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 the text that you shared with me. The the unpublished text. There was that feeling of like being invited to share her poetry at historically black colleges and her having a hesitation because how will that be received? So if you could just speak towards that sense of anti-blackness in our communities and how she navigated that, right? So taking this bus, you described this bus trip from New York to Miami. Um, you know, so like on the Greyhound through the South. Talk to me a little bit about um, that, what it is to be a spick, right? To be seen as a spick on that Greyhound, but also to be really hyper aware of the classism, the sexism, right? Esa divorciada, she's divorced, dirty, untouchable, mm -hmm. and, and grifa. Yes. So let's say grifa name. Well, maybe it will be wonderful if I share with you this story. I have a friend, a Grifa friend, called Cristina Carradero. She always, she is in a wheelchair because she had an accident at 17 years old and she landed in a, in a wheelchair. She's also an activist of Black Lives Matter in Puerto Rico. And the other day she was trying to get into her building that is, you know, with lots of tourists and, and one tourist, one woman, a Afro-American woman started yelling at her, telling her, you know, speak English, speak English, and threw a, a glass of, of alcohol in her face. What, what I'm trying to say here is that we shouldn't romanticize our communities. You know, we have communities that have uh, a whole bunch of rage and very, very, in which many discourses intersect. Maybe you are African American and you are being marginalized in the United States, but then you go to the Caribbean and you bring imperialist um, mm. uh, ways with you. Or maybe you are a Puerto Rican that is that in Puerto Rico and in Cuba say ay 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 de la grifa negra, but then goes to the United States and gets worried of being, you know, uh, treated as another ne Negro. In 1930s and 40s, we have to also remember that um, between, in 1926, no, 1921, there was 26 race riots in different places of the United States. And the last lynching was in 1981, up until now. You know, police brutality has always been a, as part of that community. And there has been a lot, and for, for a person from the island, that, came, that kind of racism is very scary. One of the reasons why I don't live in the United States is because of that racism. I'm, I'm telling you the truth, you know, I can't handle it. Mira mi amor, yo estoy así. <laughs> Sorry, he's working. But one of the things that is really uh, difficult for us is that our brand of racism is different from the brand of racism that is in many other places in the world, but especially in the United States because of our cross, you know, connection. And half of our people live in the States. And, uh, you know, mi tía, mi prima, like, tu gente vive en Salinas y la mía vive en Maryland, you know, and I'm always going back and forth and trying to visit my, my nephews. And that is something that is more common now for many places in the world. So there is a moment in her diary, in the diary of Julia de Burgos, in which she has to work in the census and she's being sent to Harlem. Mm -hmm. And in Harlem, she writes to her sister and she says, you know, I, there is not one white person in this side of Harlem and these people uh, live in very bad conditions and they're primitive and angry and she doesn't understand. But the worst part of that is that she reproduces the discourse of uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 of, of the discourse of racism 
when she speaks about her sisters and brothers. And I think that that is something that we, we cannot hide. That happened in, in Julia. Uh, and I believe that it is because um, she was a newcomer and she couldn't understand. I am not saying that she didn't have that problem, but there's two things that just, cogen su visión y la tuercen, you know, they, they make her see it in that way and out comes racism, but it is also an ethnic racism. It is a racism within the black community because she says, and that happens a lot in Puerto Rico too, there's this ethnic racism against, racism against Dominicans and then the Dominicans right. have it for, for Haitians and then right. the Haitians, you know, we have to stop that crap. <laughs> because it's just stupid. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then there's colorism and then there's, you know, but right. one of the things that is very difficult for us in the island to understand, one is the amount of, of violence that we see in many other racialized uh, communities. I have to see, say it because sometimes I don't know how to deal with it. I mean, I, I live in a three million people island. And I'm not saying that there is no racism, but there is no genocide. There is not a planned genocide mm -hmm. agenda. So I can relax. You know, I don't have to be <laughs> worrying which, you know, which, which street I cross because in the other side of the street, I might be killed. That, that I don't have that in my experience. I do have a, a very a disgusting and angry experience with what I call the White Ricans. And the White Ricans are not the Hincho Ricans. You know, there might be people that are clear, uh, what I call Caribbean white, but that they feel that they are one of many. But then when class and race interest yeah. in Puerto Rico, it's just disgusting. When class and race intersects and you have white people and then rich, privileged people that are part of the six or eight families, mm -hmm. Creole, Hacendado families, damn, you know? <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, how do I deal with that? I, 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 how, can, how can we talk? Because it is a very difficult dialogue uh, between class, race, and, and, and the Hacendado, the old Hacendado mm -hmm. privilege families. And that's what we call whites. See, what we call whites, los blanquitos, it has to do a lot with race and, and class. a construction of race and also class. And uh, Julia was very clear about, you know, the rejection of that. But then when mm -hmm. she came from outside of the island and she, she found this incredible amount of different ethnicities just sliding in New York, she was baffled. I said, what the heck? What is this? And she reproduced some racist um, ideas in her uh, at the same time that she was also striving to create a connection between migrant people in New York and in Washington. So yes, she was a very um, contradictory thinker, but she was the first woman who thought about yeah. So in Latin so America. In all Latin America, you know, Gabriela Mistral wasn't thinking about this thing. Her, her story was different. She was she was gay. She, she was a lesbian woman in the 40s that had this lover called Norma that was a teacher, and she did it the other way around, you know. But Julia was the one that could talk and navigate between race and immigrant and Puerto Rican and colonial and, and, and thought of herself as a pan-Latina. She was one of the first that transcended the, the nationalist discourse. And I believe, and this is just to, to, come to, to stop, um, to finish, I believe that there was also a rejection of everything that was American. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. As an independentista, she yes. rejected everything that she perceived as American because nationalism does that. Nationalism is monolithic. And it, 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 it is a weird way of, of, of defining everybody that is from a nation in the same category. You're all Americans, mm -hmm. like me. 
your old Puerto Ricans will know. You know, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans and different Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican Dominicans, and people that are Chinese and people who are Lebanese and people from all over. And um, it is a great, um, uh, I always think that Puerto Rico is a great um, Pietri dish of globalization. Mm. You know, if you look at it, and also the ways in which the connection between one person and the other is very, very close. Yes. I cannot, I cannot, there's no, I have no problem with people that do not look like me. Actually, when I am in places where everybody is exactly my same skin color, I get, I get very, because I'm Latina. We come in oh, no different, you know, our, our, connect, our information and our ways of thinking of race is different. We yeah. come in all colors. Punto. Mis hijos no son del mismo color que yo. Mis Igual. hijos. And I push them out of my body. I'm sure that they came out of me. And they don't look like me, <laughs> you know? Yo and tengo un rubio y un colorado. Pues, mi hija, imagínate, yo tengo una java. No, no, yo tengo un java y una plata. <laughs> That's, you know, I can, you know, I think that if I decide to be a mother again, I will, voy a tener un unicornio. This is just, <laughs> and I love it that way. But then again, you know, these possibilities of talking about race in we have a long way to start talking about race among our communities. Yeah. I want to, we still have some time before we open to questions. So I want to turn to the literary. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would love to, again, take a point of personal privilege. I would love to share a poem that I wrote um, while I was dissertating because your work reminded me of this poem and I want to, where we go? Okay. So your, your, your work in progress, La Otra Julia, is this novel, nonfiction novel is how you described it. Um, and there's the narrator who is writing Julia and writing herself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of the construction. And it just struck me because there's this thing that we do um, that I think is one of the challenges of being both an academic and a creative. We literally talk to our subjects. So we don't just write about them. We're also writing to them and with them. And they're, they're in conversation with us because it's not so academic. No. So often. It's really hard to, to take away like Oh. That creative impulse. So I'm going to read the poem and then I have some questions for you. Uh -huh. Esto se llama Poetas en un Bar. Julia, Sandy, Gloria, Josefina, la que walk into a bar. But not just any bar. Camaradas, templo de bomba, esquina de jíbaro, jíbaras y jíbaro sandwiches. Josefina notes the, thi the thinning out of el varios nie. Aquí los witty witty se han llegado, pero qué rápido, comenta la que. Only the Bronx stays safe, opines Sandy. Though if Lumbergo has his way, not for long. They say the Bronx is back. She shrugs. Where did we go? Julia pours the sangria. Como cambian las cosas, como no. Esta musiquita y este calorcito. Al menos aquí adentro estamos en el barrio, ¿no? But maybe that East Harlem mess will stick. Gloria laughs. Julia, your barrio is my barrio now. No, how I would have killed for tortas y horchata when I lived here. Y ahora me cuesta conseguir los tostones de ayer. Como cambia esta ciudad? A toast calls Josefina, wa waving over the author of honor, the note taker, the chronicler, the youngin. Que a la doctora doctoriando los cuentos de Ñe, Josefina y de Dominica en York, Gloria y de las chicanas lesbianas en Nueva York, Sandy y de las newyorkeñas, Julia y de nosotras. That's so beautiful. Yay. And so, talk to me about 
how do you how did you come to that structure? How did you come to this idea of nonfiction novel? These interweaving back and forth. The ancestra. Eso mismo. Um, one of our most important aesthetic and ethic, you know, ethical standpoints is to recover ancestry. You know, we have a history and we have a memory and it has been erased in order to convince us that we are people with some history and that we have been accents because of our sake, because we haven't had people before us who were there and uh, achieving wonderful things. So uh, because I believe in ancestry, because I, I am a Santera and I always, every, every waking morning I say, water, I want to be like water and connect with my dead, with my ascended masters, and with the forces of nature, because my ancestors are in here, in my DNA. They are the blood that runs through my veins, and there are they, the shoulders in which I raise myself. This is something that Santeros say, and I believe this. You know, I am a person with a PhD that is a Santera. I am a witch with a PhD. Beware. <laughs> <laughs> you can do both. You can do both. And um, because I'm a witch with a, with a PhD and I'm a published author, and, and I think that that is an organic way of presenting ourselves in the world. I've never seen so many of us with PhDs studying in universities, you know, challenging the ways in which narratives are being told. Never in my, in my life I've seen so many of us. And we are all over. We're in Chiapas, we're in Guerrero, we're in Peru, we're in Ecuador, we're in Bolivia, we're in, in Paris, we're in Spain, we're everywhere. There's no way of getting rid of us anymore. So we have a great moment in which we can revise the story and see where we at. And that's what I try to do. This is the story of a person called Mayra Santos Febres that was appointed to write the biography of Julia uh, for the uh, celebration of the 100 years of her birth, which happened. I was called to do this. And I finished um, the assignment, but I, 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 I felt that I haven't said enough. So this story starts, you know, going back and forth between Julia's life, the one that I imagined that I cannot tell in this biography because I, you know, it's an academic and dry and objective <laughs> biography. I don't know what that is, but I was getting paid and I needed the money, so I did it. And then I said, wait a minute, there's another life. And I start to uh, write, and I imagined in my head, uh, you know, when you skip a, a, um, when you skip a rock, you have all these ondas. Well, I think that we live like in ondas, and I was trying to write in that way. What happened to Julia? What happened to me? What happened to Mama Paula? What happened to my mother? What happened to me trying to be a writer? What happened to Julia trying to be a writer? And the celebration at the end of what she achieved for all of us, you know? So that is the structure of the novel, but I have written so many uh, things about Julia because it's like this, this constant obsession that I have, you know? Because I'm always scared and I have to say it, you know? It's not that I pay a lot of attention to that, to that uh, miedo, but I live with it. Mm -hmm. And I has just become my friend because it's there, it won't go away. What is it that I have to do in order to be remembered? Mm. Or not to be erased? That's why I write so much. I never noticed it before until I wrote this thing with Julia. You know that we are all overachievers because we're just scared of being <laughs> You know, we are overachievers and we have to be the best, but it is not, it's really weird because I don't really want to be rich. I don't like 
things, not much. I like books and men and, and <laughs> to travel and to write. That's what I like. And kids. I like kids and people and men and books. That's it. And, um, and oh, I'm really nice and cheap things that I can put in my ears. <laughs> I really like putting a lot of things in my, in my ears. But one of the things that um, I noticed, what this in, is this incredible precariedad, this sense that we're always doing things that could be just erased from the face of the earth very, very easily. And that's why we keep doing and we keep doing and we keep doing until we kill ourselves sometimes. And, um, and I wrote this novel in order to stop, to stop writing from that point of fear and to come to terms with the fact that it's too late already. I mean, maybe Julia has been erased uh, or was erased at a particular moment in her life when she was, you know, she was found in the street and she was, uh, la, la certificado de defunción said, you know, this is Jane Doe and we don't mm -hmm. know who she is and who cares. But we, as a community has made her eternal. Yes. She, you know, she doesn't, she, she, she's not dead. You know, she, she's not dead. And that is, at least for me, is such a balsamo, it's such a, a way of healing, you know, knowing that Julia was there and all these women are there now that I am not alone and that I have and belong to a community and that we can raise our voices and explore our condition and identity and our history and that we, it's impossible to be killed, mm. to be erased. So that's, that's why I wrote. Um, I have a, I, I want to, wait. <laughs> I want now <laughs> to read my poem about Julia. Yay. Donde esta Julia? This is from Ana Muy Manigua. This, I wrote this at 19 years old. And this is a, a poem. Uh, this is a poetry book, Ana Muy Manigua. I was 19 years old. And I started crying because I didn't know my history. And... Um, And I wrote this. 105 Nueva York. Del campo a un arrabal de Río Piedras, a Comerío, Naranjito, San Juan, Cuba, New York, Washington, New York, y muerta de nuevo a Puerto Rico. That's my story. Dos meses después de caída en la calle 105 Harlem. Julia, de 39 años en el 53 cuando le explotó el hígado de versos contra la explotación, se le explotó el hígado en boleros, en ese celebrado rito discur discursivo, es decir, que se murió en pleno vuelo como un pajarito, pero pum, cayó cual piedra en la calle 105. Igual tembló el Caribe. Se le simbronearon los bobines a las oficinistas, vendedoras, operarias, maestras de escuela rural. Los burócratas siempre asustadísimos corretearon por las oficinas. Se decidieron a emplear estrategias fabulosas para prevenir que se reciclara en brío su cuerpito de grifo arrabal, su gigantesco hígado poemático, su rosis hepática gritaron aquí el certificado de la borracha. Y todavía se lamenta. Lo peor que hicieron fue devolvérsela a la isla porque ni aún con la leyenda de mártir amorosa aquella no acababa de morirse. Y hasta intentaron cambiarle el número a la calle para callar el retumbe de pum, cayó la Julia hasta las lenguas que en solaz le ha dejado los archivos. Patas That's my... Thank you. I wrote this at 19 years old and I continue, I continue writing about Julia. So I had to write that novel. Maybe I can write about something else now. <laughs> <laughs> Before we open it up to all the other questions, I just want to quote you from that novel because I think this is something you do so powerfully, so well, and so importantly. In it, the narrator writes, No quería endiosarla ni condenarla, tan solo transcribirla. And I think 
the eternal tension with Julia is and Diosala, the Lala Madonna, <laughs> the Madonna whore thing. She wasn't Diosala, or Condenala, the the drunk <laughs> of New York, New York group. And the way you write her, and the way I think more of us write her now, is with the complexity. Yes. Her humanity. She was a woman, and that's a complicated thing. And yes. so I think the way que la transcribe es un servicio for the rest of us. Ay, qué lindo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think that, you know, the good thing is that, again, I am Santera. I'm going to kill that, though. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the things is that, you know, we have this weird thing. Gods are not supposed to be perfect. They're supposed, our gods. They're, they're supposed fun. to be fun. And there's, there's people... And we have to learn, at least that's the way in which we deal with, you know, Chum and Jemaja, which is that you learn from their mistakes and their achievements. That is what a God should be. That is what an archetype is supposed to be. It's like when you, when you're, I'm Pisces. And I know, you know, that when they tell you, you know, you're Pisces, well, I am not shy, but I, I hate conflict. And uh, that is my strength and my weakness. Because sometimes I don't fight to, because I hate conflict. I am very bad uh, uh, when I get angry because I just go for the kill. I don't, you know, I never get angry. <laughs> but when I get angry, I go for the kill. And, um, and I will kill you. <laughs> so, so I try not to get angry. So, you know, this is what Pisces is. You are very sentimental. You're very passionate. And you have to really learn how to control your emotions because you will kill people. And, um, and, and that is an archetype. And that is why Ochun and why, you know, Maria Guadalupe, La Virgen de la Guadalupe, or whatever gods we decide to invent, are there to teach us how to learn from the mistakes, from the weaknesses, and also from the achievements. That's why, you know, Christianity really doesn't do it for the <laughs> traditional way, because they have so little gods, they only have three. And you know, el, el Padre, el Hijo y el Espíritu Santo. Okay. And then Maria is this woman that cries in a corner and she was 14 years old, the poor girl, when she decided to be the vessel of a God. And she didn't get it. You know, she was like, ah, I like Eva much more and Maria Magdalena <laughs> and Lilith and all those weird women that were like, ah, you know, I, no, paradise is not for me. And, 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 but I like studying, you know, the cryptic Christian uh, religions that, and the spiritualism that also brought all these women out as mm -hmm. archetypes. Eh, la Virgen Negra de la Monserrate, eh, Ma, which is de Maya, y la Virgen de la Guadalupe, Caribe del Pobre, and all those one and el Indio, y nuestro, el Niñito de Jesús, el Sagrado Niño de Jesús, el Corazón. I, no, I love all that because it's so rich in terms of metaphors to understand. Mm -hmm. So, yes, for me, Julia is like nuestra madre poetisa Julia de Burgos, but she was a mean woman to me. Yeah. She was me. And I like her like that. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> oh. Ivan, do you want to take over the, the question? I don't know if you guys had a specific way, if you want me to read in here, if there are questions. I haven't been looking at the chat, so... Let me see if my cat, if my dog is, is biting my turtle. I have like a zoo in my house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll figure out logistics. I know we're wrapping up soon, but maybe if anybody has a question. Yeah, I think the best so, way would just be if you have a question to unmute yourself and just ask. Yeah, me. that's yes. even better. Kiwi, no, coma, no te coma la tortuga, no. You don't have a question? 
He says, this is fantastic. Carolina says, my bisabuela would never hear to this yet. My abuela either. And I am <laughs> daughter of a Pentecostal pastor. Ooh. My father wants to see. <laughs> Nena, ¿cuándo tú vas a aceptar al Señor? Y yo digo, he aceptado como cuatro señores. Yo me he casado cuatro veces. Yo feliz de aceptar a señores. <laughs> There's no problem with me and señores. Just give me, you know, I just change them. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? You can ask me whatever. I did have one question. Um, I was wondering now, we've seen the a lot of feminist, strong feminist movements come up now against abortion, not against abortion, but in favor of abortion. And also in Puerto Rico on the island, um, there's the group called La Cole. Mm -hmm. La Cuba con mm -hmm. sí. And I was just wondering um, in what ways, if at all, does Julia de Burgos's writing sort of inform or influence the ideologies of like these current feminists on the island? Do well, we see that or mm -hmm. bring on that? Yeah. La cole, la colectiva feminista y todas, and also este, plena combativa, the good friends. We have been working with them together and also with Colectivo Ile. And what is going on is basically the, the biggest part, uh, pay, the biggest amount of fight is against the domestic violence and violence against women. You know, the figures have risen incredibly since the hurricane. There is a state of emergency right now that is actually not being enforced. And then people, we are all fighting from different uh, fronts. And Julia was really important because, uh, you know, yo misma fui mi ruta. Y yo quise hacer lo que los hombres quisieron que yo fuese un intento de vida, un juego al escondite con mi ser. Those are the words of the first feminist in Puerto Rico and in many other places in the United, in, in, in all these Americas, you know, in our Americas, the Americas from the North and from the South. And um, Julia is one, it's really incredible. I'm trying to find them. You know, there's all these t-shirts and, 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 and earrings and all this parafernalia that is always uh, quoting Julia. Um, and it's amazing because if you think of the paradigm of Julia, that contradictory also way in Julia, you have to just remember her. First, she was married to Roberto Beauchamp when she was 19 years old. By the time that she was 23 years old, she divorced. That was in 1920, wait, 19, yeah, at the end of the 1920s or 1932, I think she divorced. And, and, you know, people would not divorce in Puerto Rico in the 1920s yeah. and 30s, and she did. Um, she always wanted to have a kid, but there is something that I couldn't, I, I wasn't able to, to, to prove it, but somebody told me. A, a lot of people have been telling about this. I just cannot find the, the, the right source, which is that he had um, an abortion, an illegal abortion, before she met Rodriguez Grullón. When she met Jimenez Grullón, she just went with him. She was not, she, she, had, she was the Simone de Beauvoir and he was Sartre, you know? They, they, they had this very, very avant-garde, very unorthodox relationship. She was a divorced woman, he was a divorced man and he, or he was trying to get divorced. Okay. And when, when, actually when they broke up was because, uh, he wouldn't marry Julia because his parents were against this Grifa divorced women that, you know, uh, wrote and wanted to be an intellectual. That's not a good white, uh, housewife material. And, <laughs> and when he left her, she left for New York City. And when he came after her, because he came after her, to look for her and to continue the relationship. She said, honey, I'm, I'm in love again. I'm in love with Armando Marin. You're too late. And um, that doesn't work. I did it. But uh, 
<laughs> that's the story of my second to third <laughs> marriage. But it, doesn't work, but it helps to get over. <laughs> um, but you know, este, I, I kind of learned from Julia, but Julia was really important as a feminist voice in all Latin America. She was one of the fiercest feminists also. Uh, but she also had this contradiction because she was always looking for love. Yeah. Love, this, this incredible, you know, romantic uh, destination. Uh, also, I don't know if it clouded her, her life. And I love love, but you know, I really like, I, I, I don't like not being in love. I don't like this thing about me, self-sufficient. I don't need anybody, who, you know, I do. I am a connective, vinculatory, very, very communal, very, very Puerto Rican, Boricua, Latina, Caribbean person. I like kissing, I hate this pandemic. I need <laughs> feel people's touch and sweat in my skin. And I am I am this close of getting infected because I'm just going to go out and start talking everybody. <laughs> uh, I don't like social distancing. I don't understand it, and I want my vacuna now because I need to feel and smell people. But um, but also there's a weird unbalance in that need of love that most of us have sometimes because of the incredible marginalization and, and the loneliness that comes with it. Mm. It is a weird kind of loneliness that we have to talk a lot more about. I was, I was thinking, I think I would love people to start talking about our love. I read recently, trying to understand Julia and other things that I'm writing, this wonderful book called All About Love by Bell Hooks. <laughs> Happened, you know, I think it was in the 90s or in early 2000s when it was published. And it, she, she was trying to talk about and understand the, the emotional upbringing of us, of people that live in the margins, that incredible need that we have for community, this, 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 this scare feeling of, of being alone in 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 the multitude you know and, and knowing that you're an easy target mm. and the, the what happens with our couples and our parejas mm. and also in our family with the need okay. of moving so much and and that that incredible demand that a lot of people have of us if we are Los pudientes, if we studied, if we went away from El Barrio, the weird relationship, I don't know if you have felt it when you go back. It is a, it's a it is, I don't know if it is envy, but sometimes it is just pure anger. You are out, why are you back? What are you doing here? It's really weird to understand. And I think that Julia also lived in that situation. Mm -hmm. That's why she needed love so much. And the, all the people that she lost, six hermanos, the mother, you know, the kid. When the she, father to the alcohol. The father to alcohol. We keep losing and losing and losing people. And maybe you are not the target of violence, but everybody else is. You know, my mother died to Alzheimer's, my brother died of an overdose, and here I am with a PhD. What could does it does that you know? Eso que me da. Hmm. I thought that it was gonna give me safety, but no, not really. And it's not that I don't need it, I really like it, but there is this pain. And I think we haven't talked about that pain. And also the incredible happiness that there is. And we dance salsa in the street and we kiss and we talk loud and we don't care. <laughs> and, so, and, and I think that we have to write more about those things. I don't know. We have a lot to write. <laughs> There's so much to be said. La signatura pendiente. Eso es cierto. But I have to say that this conversation, the energy and sort of just all the vitality from this conversation has just been amazing. 
I mean, just personally. Jay has a question. Ah. Oh. We, we have, we don't have too much time left, but Elaine, if you'd like to um, unmute and ask your question, um, please go ahead. Or if not, I could just read it from the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I am, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so I just wanted a uh, recommendation some books about Julia de Burgos' wife. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendation? Yes, there is two wonderful books. One of them is a, and I think that that is, that's what I work with. I, I work with El Diario de Julia de Burgos. That's this diary that was recuperated from the, her time at uh, Welfare Island. And oh. that diary is amazing. Where is that? It's just El Diario. Sí, encontraron El Diario de Julia de Burgos. And it's amazing. I mean, most of the things that I, that I refer to uh, that novel come from that diario. And also, Cartas a Consuelo, which are... Yeah. The, 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 the las cartas de consuelo that she wrote to her sister telling her everything. That's the everything. best, that's, that's, that's amazing, you know. From the time that she was uh, with Jimenez Grullón in New York and the day that she was walking down the street looking at, at the Rockefeller, uh, the, and the Empire State Building and the Rockefeller Center yeah. and when she went to a dining and what is this semaphore, what is this people? Uh, to the time in which she went to, to Cuba, to Bag, you know, it is rich. That is incredibly rich. Uh, there are 131 uh, uh, cartas that are missing. That are the ones that she wrote to uh, Pupucho, that's her last lover, uh, the one that found her when she was dead, with Armando Marin, the second husband. Um, and uh, those cartas are missing. <clears throat> there has been transcribed, but I haven't been able to read them. But that's the only thing that is missing. And I think that uh, the family, this is just me talking, that uh, la, fa la familia de, de Julia de Burgo do not want uh, the, those letters to be revealed because that's when, when she was deep, deep, deep into alcoholism. Mm. So, you know, they want to protect the image. And... Um, but all of the other things, Las Cartas y El Diario, they're out. You should read them. And you can find them with La Esquina. There are these books, 787, Libro 787. Yeah. Yeah, I know, you know? them. They're very good. Yeah, they're yeah. very good. And they were, they were, they were este, founded by students of mine, Quero y Carlito. So Libro 787 y también Brands of Puerto Rico or Brands of the Americas. This guy, Alan Taveras, is a black Puerto Rican. And he was the founder of Brands of Puerto Rico. So if you, and they sell everything, gandules, cafe, and books, and artesanías, and they come right to your door. So don't buy from Amazon. Fuck those. And, um, I'm sorry. And uh, I don't like them. I buy from them sometimes, but I don't like them. Um, so uh, this is important, and that's a place where you can see and, and feel that contradiction and, and wonderful life. All right, thank you very much, and I love this conversation. So how I feel like I know you from somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, there, this book is, yeah. a, is a, um, an academic uh biography by Vanessa Perez Rosario so this is kind of she definitely looked at the letters and the diary and and talks about them in there and then this este. is a poem sí, in, in um in both bilingual in español y inglés it's one of the first um translation that attempts to translate all but this is not her full this even this is not all her poetry <laughs> she had so much um but it's a great these two are a great start to it if, especially if spanish is not accessible to you um for those of you who spanish is not accessible if you don't read spanish those are two english oh, that spanish are good is the first language 
Great. Well, I, I'm saying it for the group because not everyone reads Spanish. I know that. <laughs> I do, but you know. Por si acaso. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. De nada. Mayra. That's it? I think Ay, no, se nos fue el tiempo, <laughs> corriendo. Bueno, pues sí. Increíble. La próxima vez con una cervecita en mano y salta detrás. Sí, una sí. medallita bien fría. Mira, Margarita, I love you so much. It's so Ay, good to see sí. you again. Judge Padre, I see you there. Tanto tiempo. Sí, ahora. Yo el otro día caminando por el parque. Well, take care. Take a lot of care and get the vaccine and put on the mask and, and, and let's get rid of this stuff soon. Please. Thank you, Mayra. Ivan, thank you for organizing and for looping us in and getting us all organized. I'll, I'll let you close us out. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mayra, for bringing us a little bit of the calorcito de la isla because it's freezing here. <laughs> <laughs> now it started raining in here pero tengan, tengan cuidado y cuídense mucho por favor we have a lot to do y yeah. nos vamos a ver pronto I can feel it in my bones <laughs> now, thank you both for giving your time in such a generous manner this afternoon I mean all the wisdom all the knowledge that you have just given us is amazing and I'm going to be saving this chat saving the recommendations so if anyone wants them um, just please reach out to me um, and I'd also like to thank our La Casa student tech coordinators, Becca and John, for their support. And also for all of you for just joining us in community this afternoon. Um, and if you're interested in looking at the recording or sharing it with any of your friends or family, um, La Casa Cultural Julia de Burgos will be uh, recording and they will be able to send that to you. So I hope to see you all at DB's 50th anniversary in March. And until then, please stay safe. And thank you for coming. Thank you all. Gracias. Gracias, Liyu. Bye, Liyu. Great to see you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>